I'll be very brief. I don't like nobody says talk and then I'll give my talk brief or brief response to their slides basically. And then we'll take questions after that. Okay. You'll introduce me, then I give my talk, then you introduce Alan. Then, I, then, we get to then he gives talk, then you give your comments, right. then we have discussion. Do we have any time to ask each other questions or for me to answer questions that you two raise sure. before we go to the audience? Sure. I mean, if there are I, mean I don't know what you guys are going to say. I might no, just, just say, I don't have anything. We're just going to ambush you. No, uh, if, yeah. if uh, you have particular thoughts on either of our presentations, we definitely afterwards if you want okay. to. That might make more sense just because if you guys ask questions and then we go straight to the audience, then I don't, you know, it looks like I've got no answer. We're on air. We're on air now. Oh, are we? Yeah. Where do you see that? You see oh, the blue above the mirror? Yeah. yeah. All right. So behave yourself. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the opening uh, public lecture of the Moral Psychology Research Group Conference. I'm happy to have as our special guest here today uh, the philosopher Walter Sinner Armstrong. Let me just tell you a little bit about Walter, uh, who I've known for many years. Uh, he is the Chauncey Stillman Professor of Practical Ethics in the Department of Philosophy and at the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke University. He is a core faculty member in the Duke Institute for Brain Sciences, the Duke Center for Cognitive Neuroscience, and the Duke Center for Interdisciplinary Decision Sciences. I think all the centers you're part of in the same way. Uh, he serves as resource faculty in the philosophy department of UNC Chapel Hill. He's partner investigator at the Oxford Center for Neuroethics and research scientist with the Mind Research Network in New Mexico. Uh, he's received fellowships from the Harvard Program in Ethics and the Professions, uh, the Princeton Center for Human Values, the Oxford uh, Center for Practical Ethics, and the Center for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics at the Australian National University, and the SAGE Center at the Study of the Mind at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, he's 
done a lot. He runs the Moral <laughs> Agency and Decision Making Lab at Duke that I had the good fortune to be part of when I was a uh, wee graduate student. And so it's great to have you here at The Rock, where we're encouraging a similar kind of interdisciplinary ethical discussion. Uh, his work is wide-ranging. He's published widely on ethics, both theoretical and applied, as well as meta-ethics, uh, empirical moral psychology and neuroscience, including work on scrupulosity, implicit moral attitudes, and psychopathy, uh, philosophy of law, epistemology, philosophy of religion, and informal logic. Uh, most recently, he's the author of uh, Morality Without God, and Moral Skepticisms, as well as the editor of Moral Psychology, Volumes 1 through 5, which I highly recommend. They're very fun. Uh, his articles have appeared in a variety of philosophical, scientific, and popular outlets. And so today, he's going to present some new work, uh, thinking about how to apply ethical theories to understand our relationship to artificial intelligence. So it's an honor to have you here. Thanks, Martin. Thank you. Thanks so much, Daryl and, uh, and the Rock Ethics Institute and Penn State for having me. Uh, it's really a great joy to take a, a topic that's dear to your heart like this uh, and new to you and to go out and test it against all you people. So I'm really looking forward to, to what you think of what I have to say here. This really is a new project. It's ongoing work. Uh, and we're in the midst of doing it. And I'm not quite sure how it's going to turn out, so you tell me. Uh, the issue is. Uh, Moral Artificial Intelligence. Oh, and I should, I should say, I want to give credit to Vince Conacher, Jana Sheikborg, uh, Kenzie Doyle. We have a group of about uh, 12 or 15 people, it varies, uh, who are working on this together at Duke. And they all get credit for a lot of what I'm going to uh, talk about uh, today. Um, basically, machines are taking over. They're doing all kinds of things in our lives today. I mean, almost all of us have smartphones. Uh, some of us have smart homes. I got a smartphone, and I like asking Siri questions, but they're not serious questions. They're, you know, just kind of joke questions. I don't understand why people have smart houses. It's like it turns on and off the lights and changes the temperature in your house without you doing anything. Like, I don't know. I want to have control over my house, so I don't have one of those. But a lot of people do, and I don't think there's anything wrong with other people having it. So that seems to be a pretty neutral you know, use of artificial intelligence uh, and of computers, uh, which is very common. Uh, less common and more surprising uh, is the use of computers in games. Uh, we can see up here uh, uh, Jeopardy. Uh, first, a computer won Jeopardy. Uh, not too surprising. Jeopardy is a game that involves knowledge and quick reactions. Like, you can't beat a computer pushing a button. It's just you know, not physically possible. So it's not that surprising that, you know, that the machine would win uh, at Jeopardy. Uh, then uh, one at chess. But chess actually shouldn't be that surprising either, because in chess, you think a certain number of moves ahead, and the computer is just going to be much better than humans at thinking number. You know, 10 moves ahead, the, the number of possibilities just multiplies. And then you, uh, humans can't keep up with computers in those kinds of circumstances. But the real accomplishment was Go. What's special about the game of Go is that even the masters of Go uh, often can't tell you why they made a certain move. You know, like if I move there, they'll move there, and then he'll move there, and then move. No, they don't do that. It just that seems right to me. That seems like the right place to go. Uh, and the computer seems to be able to play that game, uh, even though it's a feeling for what's the right move, as opposed to a rule for what's the right move. How does it do it? It plays itself a billion times and finds out what works and what doesn't work, uh, com computes the patterns, uh, and then uh, and then can play the game very well. But it also comes up with new patterns, which is quite interesting. In one of the games, uh, the computer, actually, uh, AlphaGo, actually made a move that all the lead Go players in the world went, oh, oh no, like, what did it do? What was that move? Why would it do that? And they couldn't figure it out. And then, you know, 10 moves later, it was clear why it had done it and it won that game. Uh, interestingly, the human, at least at all, uh, in the next game, made the same move and won. <laughs> so basically, the computer came up with a new move, 
and the human copied it. Uh, so what does that tell you? Well, that raises ethical issues about the status of humans in the universe and whether we're something special, uh, whether we have capacities that other species and other types of uh, objects and creatures uh, don't have. Uh, but it's not really going to be immoral yet. So it's not really about ethics yet, uh, using computers for this kind of application. Uh, what about driverless cars? How many people have actually ridden in a driverless car? Yeah, you got to do it. You can go to, you, if you go out, you know, to a place where they have a dealer, you can do it. I did it just a few weeks ago. It's kind of eerie. You're driving down the highway and it starts to shift to the left and you can't go back to the right because it's driving. Uh, and then they person, ah, it's just a beta version of the program. You know, don't worry <laughs> about it. Uh, I was worried. Uh, so anyway, uh, what happens is sometimes you know, they sense the different cars around and where the lines are and stay in the lane. But every once in a while, there's an accident. This is a, uh, a Tesla car after it ran into a Mack truck. Reportedly, it was going up a hill, and the truck was white. And it, so it, it thought it was a cloud. Uh, and then just you know didn't put on the brakes and didn't detect it for one reason or another. Uh, the bad news is uh, you know it was a horrible accident. Uh, the good news is you know they fixed that glitch in the program and it probably won't happen again. If only it were so easy with humans. And that's part of the lesson that we'll see uh, as this talk goes on. Uh, but this does raise ethical issues because of course people's lives are going to be at stake when the computer program goes awry, uh, or when you hit an emergency situation. Uh, then uh, moral issues uh, arise. And we'll talk about some of those later. <clears throat> AI and computers are also used in medicine. I don't know if you can read this. Uh, this is a case where uh, Watson actually correctly diagnosed a leukemia patient that all the best doctors in the world couldn't figure out what was going on and what form of leukemia and what they ought to do, and Watson figured it out. Why is Watson able to do that? Now think about what would a computer have as an advantage in this particular area? It sifted through 20 million cancer research papers. Just imagine if your professor assigned 20 million papers for the next class. It's like there's no chance. This computer did it in 10 minutes. And so it can keep up with this massive literature that doctors can't keep up with. And as a result, the computer can actually do better at medical diagnosis, at least in some situations, not all, but in some situations. And so people are kind of getting used to the idea of uh, when it saves to somebody's life, then what would you say when you go into the hospital and you've got leukemia, would you rather have your doctor or the computer diagnose you? No, some people are going to go with the computer even today, uh, or at least checking it. We'll talk about, about this case as well. People are using, uh, hospitals are using computers for kidney exchanges. What happens with some kidney cases is that uh, you get a kidney from a, a cadaver, uh, and it just becomes available, and you're the closest person that uh, has the right blood type and so on. But what happens with live donors is often you get one person who needs a kidney, the recipient is the wife, and the husband says, I'll donate a kidney, but wait a minute, doesn't have the right blood type. And then down the street, in another part of town, there's a sister and a brother, but they don't match either. And then there are a couple of friends, this one needs a kidney, that one's willing to donate, they don't match either, and you have to switch. So you take this kidney, give it to that person, right? And that kidney, give it to that person, this kidney, give it to that person, and then you get a kidney exchange. And the question is, when you've got you know, 10 potential recipients and 10 potential donors, how do you figure out which ones you're going to do and which ones are you not going to do? Uh, that's going to obviously affect people's lives. And it turns out to be a very difficult computational problem uh, to maximize the various values that you want in that system. Uh, and so people are turning to computers uh, to try to help them uh, do a better job of that. Uh, police. Police are also using computers now and artificial intelligence. In this case, we're talking about where to send police to monitor, to look for crimes. Because you can check data over the past year of where the crimes have occurred and find out, oh, we need to send an extra car over there, or we need to have an extra officer over here, or we don't need that officer over there. 
ethical issues, again, are going to arise all the time. Why? Because the data that you've got is colored by the fact that that's an area where, where the cops were more active before and were more likely to arrest people before. Uh, and so now you've got a higher crime rate, and then you're going to send more cops into that area, and that's just going to feed the tendency for those people, for that particular group, to get arrested more often for more serious crimes. And that's going to then be uh, unfair. It's going to be a problem of distributive justice. And so all of these new, these, these uses of artificial intelligence are raising serious ethical issues in a way that smart houses and smartphones uh, didn't. As we move along and have AI you know, injected into more and more parts of our life, the, the ethical issues get more and more serious. Criminal law. A lot of people say, oh, we should never use computers in criminal law to decide who's guilty or how much sentence they could, should get. Um, well, they're now being used already for bail in San Francisco. Artificial intelligence systems are being used to decide who get, has to stay in jail while they wait for trial and who gets released on their own reconnaissance, maybe with uh, you know, putting some money up for bail. Uh, and that makes a big difference to somebody's life. Because notice if you have to stay in jail before your trial, and the trial is a year away, you lost your job, you don't get to see your kids during that period, uh, and if you're released on bail, you get to keep your job, you get to see your kids during that whole period. And so even the people who were found innocent, if you were not released on bail, you just spent a year behind bars, even though you were found innocent. And so um, this is going to make a big difference in people's lives. And so some people think that that type of decision should not be made uh, by computers, right? And that's the issue we're talking about now. Should it be made by computers? Um, Counterterrorism, another use of artificial intelligence. What I'm trying to do is to show you these one use after another to show you how many different areas of our life uh, computers and artificial intelligence are invading. And this is especially seen as an invasion because it's an invasion of privacy. We're taking all your Android data, uh, using it, correlating with who you're contacting, what, uh, what's the content of your message, and so on. If that information is given to a computer, uh, we can figure out whether you are likely to be a terrorist who's going to bomb a building. Now, some people think that's great. It's going to be more effective, stopping the terrorism. Other people view that as a horrible invasion of privacy. And so again, I'm just trying to give you examples where more artificial intelligence raises uh, moral issues. And of course, in drones, uh, because in the military, um, pilotless vehicles or airplanes, missiles, and so on uh, have to make decisions, sometimes split-second decisions. You see a house. You're supposed to bomb that house. But wait a second. There's a white van outside the house. Four people get in it and drive away. Now, what do you think? Are the four people who got in it the terrorists you're trying to shoot, you're trying to kill, or are they the family, right? And, or is the family left? So do you go after the building? Do you go after the vehicle? Well, in war, people have to make decisions of that sort on a regular basis very quickly. And some people are suggesting that computers and artificial intelligence would be better able to make those decisions. Uh, can they be controlled by humans at that point? Whew, depends on how much time you got, right? Because it might be a very fast, almost split-second decision that needs to be made about where the missile's going to go. If it's already in flight, it's got to decide whether to go that way or that way. Uh, and humans might go, I don't know, let me think about it. No, nope, can't think about it. It's got to be made right now. And that's where a computer might be seen as potentially more useful. Useful both in catching the terrorists, but also useful in not hitting the non-terrorists, that is, the innocent people, right? Fewer mistakes, maybe, if computers are done properly, if they're done properly. That's the issue. Uh, oh, this is my favorite. So I don't, know, I don't know how they grade papers at Penn State, but I'm thinking at Duke, what we're going to start doing is just getting them graded by computer, because what they have, is, you know, there's a, some great advantages to that, and not just for the professors. They did a demo uh, at Chapel Hill where they had the professor grade a paper. Uh, this was a real paper in a real class. The professor graded it, the TA graded it, okay, and the computer graded it. And the computer grade in, I think it was eight times out of ten, was closer to the professor than the TA was. 
So that means if the professor, you know, I as a professor go, well, of course, my grade was right. And so if the computer is closer to the grade that I gave, then I think the computer is more likely to get it right than this TA in the class. And you go, oh, yeah, but there's a big difference, right? So what's the difference? The TA gives comments. No, the computer gives comments, too. And in seven times out of 10, the student liked the computer comments better than the TA comments. OK? So now, what do we got all these TAs for? You know, uh, why don't we just take these big classes and you can just get them graded? So we actually did that in our online course. We teach this online course, and it's got, I mean, right now it's got 150,000 students in it, you know, but it's had 800,000 over the years. And how do you grade so many papers? The answer is, you know, you can have them submit essays and get graded in a very reliable way if you use this computer program. Uh, I could never hire that many TAs, right? For 150,000 students, wouldn't work. Um, there are some problems, of course, uh, and there are ways to beat it. Uh, you can imagine what they are, uh, but some people think this is just ridiculous. When you are being educated, you should be interacting with the educators, with the professors, with the students. This is just anathema. This is horrible. This is some kind of nightmare. Uh, other people uh, think, well, if it gives better grades and better comments and people end up learning more, then it's better serving the purpose of education. So another kind of moral issue here. Uh, caregivers. Um, I have no idea what's going on here. It looks like some kind of green Martian carrying this. Per but I, I thought the picture was kind of cool, so I threw it in there. The one I really know about is down here. This is a, um, a, a robot that's a caregiver for this woman whose husband uh, died. And her kids live on the other side of the country, and she didn't want them to come take care of her. And they tried to hire uh, you know, person help, help by humans, uh, but it turned out to be unreliable, and they were you know, not so great in terms of her relationship. And so they ended up with this robot taking care of this elderly woman. And there's a little video uh, that I couldn't show, but um, it shows the robot turning to her and go, saying, you don't seem to be feeling very well today. Um, you like didn't get up out of bed as fast as usual. Is something going wrong? Claudine is her name, Claudine. Uh, and he says it in a very nice voice, right? And then um, she goes, yeah, well, you know, and, and he said, you know, I already phoned the doctor, and we're going to you know, make an appointment to check your meds to make sure that everything's, you know, Right, and, and so um, the computer does this. Well, it might do it a lot better than any other caregiver. And then after, she, she says, thanks, yeah, I probably ought to go see the doctor. And he says to her, would you like to dance? And he holds out his hand, and then she grabs his hand, and then they dance together to this really kind of lovely uh, erotic music. Uh, <laughs> and, and so... Some people watch this video. You really ought to go watch it online. It's amazing. Some people watch it, and they're just like so turned off. They're just disgusted by the whole idea of this woman dancing with a robot uh, to this erotic music. And, um, and uh, other people say, you know, isn't that sweet? Otherwise, she would be all alone and would have some caregiver that she didn't get along with. Uh, and so we've got a real moral issue here. Uh, what I've been trying to impress upon you uh, is AI is all over the place. It's, it's all over the place right now. This is really going on. This is not, you know, dreamed up for the future. Uh, and some of these uses are going to be a lot more common in the future, but they're all going on to at least some extent now. Uh, and so our lives are already being invaded by artificial intelligence and by computers. And so a lot of people are beginning to worry about whether the machines are taking over. And actually, our lives are going to end up being run by computers uh, instead of us uh, running our own lives. Uh, that's the problem. Uh, and they think some of these, um, some of these uses uh, are immoral. So uh, that's the first issue. Some of these issues, uh, uses are immoral. And so, should we stop them one by one, the ones that are immoral and the ones that are not? Well, first, we've got to figure out which ones are immoral, right? We have to, we have to uh, say, well, caregiving, yes. 
uh, drones, no, uh, and draw a line. But to do that, we've got to figure out which ones are immoral. And so I don't want to like, come in you know, as an ethics professor and say, here, I'll tell you. Uh, I mean, I'd be happy to do that, but that's not what I'm going to do now. Uh, instead, what I'm going to do is, is tell you about a little survey we did. Uh, so we took a whole bunch of uses of artificial intelligence right, throughout society, uh, some of which are used today, some of which are not, and asked people, so here's a type of decision that's made that affects people's lives. Do you think that computers ought to make this decision or humans ought to make this decision? Okay? Uh, so we basically, here's an example. Art museums have to decide which new pieces of art to buy and display in the museum. Should you leave that up to humans, or should you have computers making that decision? Notice that if you leave it up to humans, then you're going to have a collection that reflects the particular taste of the director of the museum. Right? which might or might not be good. If you leave it up to computers, you can actually have it better fit the taste of the people in the area of the museum who are more likely to show up at the museum. Because it can, it can figure out which things it liked, which things it didn't like. Just like Pandora, right? How many people use Pandora? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people. So that's for music, but you could do it for art. And then the computer could just say, OK, well, we're going to buy things that people who come to the museum will like as opposed to the director. And so we're asking people, which do you think uh, ought to be done? OK? Um, and uh, we also ask them uh, which one, the human or the computer, is more likely to make the, the best decision. Uh, have you heard about computers making this kind of decision? Uh, and uh, have, you, have you heard about humans making this type of decision? That applied to some of the cases. Here's the data. Uh, it turns out that when you ask, you know, should we use computers to decide which items to, to buy for a grocery store, everybody goes, fine, who cares, right? Yeah, let the computer do it, right? Um, uh, insurance, how much should the insurance rates be? That's fine, too. Uh, detecting bribery in the local government, well, that's right up around the 50-50 mark, okay? But when you get over here to punishment, Right? How much should the punishment be in a criminal trial? Most people are way up there saying, no, 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 don't let computers do that. That's going too far. Okay? And uh, here's the art museum. Most people thought you should let the human do it. It was just weird, because I thought you should let the computer do it, since I've known some really weird taste. You know, I'm some directors of museums with really weird taste. I'd rather have the computer do it. But uh, this was an arts magnet school and a science magnet school. We thought that actually computers would be better at the science magnet school than at the art magnet school, but you can tell they're not different at all. In both cases, uh, most people said that you should leave those decisions as to which kids get into the magnet schools up to people, uh, not to computers. Uh, and so on with uh, who should get promoted in a job, which news story should a newspaper run, uh, where should a drone be targeted, uh, where should uh, the police look for graffiti? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Who, who is the big, uh, is the top suspect for who created did a particular act of graffiti, uh, and so on? Uh, so what you get is a big variation uh, among them. Uh, these, by the way, were the catch trials. Uh, should you have uh, or should computers or soccer or humans decide where to pass the ball during a soccer game? And almost everybody said human. If you didn't, we threw you out. Uh, and, and what about, this is GPS. Like, you know, if you, you know, were really sick and had to get to the hospital very quickly and your life was on the line, uh, would you ask Daryl, like, how to get there? Uh, or would you turn to your GPS and go with Google? Google, absolutely, no question about it. Uh, and so if you didn't go that way, uh, we kicked you out. Uh, so it's not surprising that there's variation. What we were looking for was why, like what's the difference uh, that makes some people favor some over others. Notice I just gave you an example where your life's on the line, but you're going to favor the GPS. So it's not whether somebody's life is on the line. Turns out that wasn't the issue. Uh, instead, 
the big issues that we found, the biggest changes were due to whether uh, computers were already being used in this area and people were aware of their being used uh, and whether uh, computers were being used successfully. And in the case where we, where we told people they are being used and they're successful, people were much uh, more willing uh, to have computers do it. So what does that tell you? That tells you that it's not something intrinsic about the area that makes people oppose the use of computers in that area. It's that they're not familiar with them and they don't trust them. And if they get more familiar and they, and they see that they're successful, they'll buy into more and more uses of computers. That's where we get the problem of what does the future look like, right? Are they going to take over? Because if they just take over more and more uh, areas, then, of course, uh, we're going to have less and less decisions of our own. And won't that mean that they can start making decisions that will just take over our lives for us? Well, no, not yet. And one reason, a standard response at least, is that each program does a particular thing. One plays chess, one plays Go, one does art museums, one does drones, and so on. Uh, but they're not all doing the same thing. So we as humans can make all these different kinds of decisions, and we can relate those decisions to each other. But the computers so far are just making very isolated types of decisions in particular areas. The problem uh, brought up by Nick Bostrom is that they can communicate with each other, okay? Just imagine you're a car. Well, it's driving down the highway. First of all, it's going to communicate with the other cars. It's got to say, I, I want to move right. You know, I want to move left. Make room for me. You're going to reduce accidents by doing that. It also is going to tell the hospital, I'm on the way. Get ready. And so now all of a sudden, you've got the systems hooking up with each other. And if they hook up with each other, and they have artificial intelligence, they can learn from each other, and Bostrom says eventually there's going to be this one unified super intelligence. Um, should we worry about that? I just want to tell you right now, I think the answer is no. We should not worry about that. I don't think that's on the horizon. Most computer scientists, most artificial intelligence people don't. It's worth thinking about, maybe it's worth worrying about a little, uh, but it's not the biggest problem we should be worried about. Nonetheless, we should take it you know, seriously and we should think about how to build morality into this artificial intelligence system. Okay? Uh, that's what we want to do. Some people might say, that's just not possible. Why is it not possible? Well, people give all kinds of arguments. I'll just mention one. Right? Morality is based on emotion. It's based on compassion or it's based on remorse or it's based on some emotion that and computers can't have emotions. Well, wait a second. We have compassion for certain people because we found out certain information about them. They were hurt. They are in pain. We can see them writhing. Well, the computer can react to that information, which made us feel compassion, and can then bypass the compassion and make the same moral judgment we do. So I don't think the fact that we make moral judgments by means of emotion means that they cannot mimic exactly those, um, uh, exactly those moral judgments. So how are we going to do it? Here's one option. We can just take a theory and apply it top down. Secondly, we can get lots of human moral judgments and use the computer program to extract it bottom up. Uh, and we can do that either in an interpretable or an uninterpretable way. I'm going to go through these. The top down method was blown apart by Asimov long ago. He gave us these three laws of robotics. Uh, and the first is, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Sounds pretty plausible at first until you think about it. Because sometimes you have to injure one human in order, um, in order to prevent harm to another human. <laughs> and then what's the computer supposed to do? It's like, you know, it just goes crazy and kind of blows up. Uh, and that's, he, they're great books, I recommend them. But Basically, he, he shows that that's not going to work. So philosophers say, ah, but that's because you've got the wrong theory. I'll tell you my theory. Uh, Bentham uh, would say, let's do utilitarianism. You ought to maximize the good or minimize harm. Well, how are you going to maximize the good? Well, at first, you've got to know what the good is. The good is pleasure. I mean, it's like give everybody free drugs or something like that. 
Uh, what about minimize harm? Well, how do you minimize harm in the world? How do you minimize suffering in the world? Kill all humans. Then there'll be like less suffering in the world. Uh, and so you don't want computers that are going to follow rules like this. Uh, and so Kantianism, never lie or murder. Well, what about lying to a murderer, you know, to prevent them from being able to murder a person they want? All of these theories, Ross, uh, W.D. Ross, comes up with seven principles. But then, how do you weigh them against the He doesn't ever tell you. He says you have to weigh them in perception, which doesn't help at all. Okay? So I don't think you're going to be able to take any of the standard philosophical theories and apply them top down. Maybe my commentators will come up with one and say, that's how you do it. Uh, I'd love to talk about it, but I don't think it's going to work. Uh, so one alternative is bottom up. Okay? Instead of top down, uh, bottom up. What do you do? You ask a thousand people, tell me about a moral problem you had, and then tell me what you think is right or wrong to do in that situation. And then you have to do it a hundred times. Describe them in your own words. Uh, and then the computer just takes all of that data and builds an algorithm that predicts what a person's going to say is immoral in new scenarios. It can predict it on the basis of features of that language that was used that you might not even think are relevant. There's some really surprising things when you start doing linguistic analysis. For example, no one's ever explained why, but males use definite articles more and females use indefinite articles more. Okay, but the computer can use something like that to predict what you're going to say <laughs> about other dilemmas. Um, and so, uh, the problem with this approach is it just requires too much data. I mean, who's going to be able to get 1,000 participants in 100 scenarios? Um, it can't explain why any act uh, is judged to be wrong because, like, to say you used a definite article instead of an indefinite doesn't tell you why. It just tells you it predicts that. Uh, and so it's not going to be able to pick out features that make any sense to us. Uh, and as a result, it's not going to be able to capture individual differences. I think that the point will become clearer when we look at the alternative, which is interpretable. Instead of just taking people describing the scenarios in whatever words they want, you don't want to start with unconstrained data. You want to start with constrained data. Uh, and so what we want to start with in our project is lists of morally relevant features. Okay? Uh, oh, let me say first, we're not trying to decide what's really moral or immoral. We're trying to decide what humans think is moral or immoral, okay? Let me make that clear. Whether, it's, whether the humans are right is another question. Uh, and uh, we're only trying to mimic it. Uh, why would we care about that? Well, it's going to, for one thing, avoid the computers taking over like Nick Bostrom, you know, warned us about, right? Because if you ask humans, do you think it's a good idea to kill all humans in order to minimize harm? Most humans are going to go, no. And so you've now avoided you know, some serious problems like that by constraining it to what humans think are acceptable. Uh, secondly, we can use it to improve our understanding of human moral thinking. We're going to understand human moral judgment better if we know the algorithms and the computations that underlie it. And we might actually improve moral thinking by being able to check the judgments that we reach against uh, computers. I'll come back to that. Okay. Uh, what we did is we said, well, we can't do this in general yet. Let's start with a pilot study. So you, ask, you take this kidney exchange, which I mentioned before, right? Different people changing kidneys in order to save as many people as possible. But which people? That's going to be the question. Uh, you ask study which features should determine who gets a kidney. Okay, you ask them that question. Uh, which features? And then they say, well, you know, health and whether it's their own fault they need a kidney and whether they have kids and so on. Uh, then you construct scenarios that vary in those features and you have them uh, make judgments about those cases, who should get a kidney in those cases. So here's an example. You might say, you know, here's one feature, how healthy is the recipient, are the recipient and the donor, how long has the recipient been on the list waiting for a kidney, uh, is it their own fault that they need a kidney because they drank themselves into oblivion for year after year, uh, and as a result of misbehavior, they need a kidney? Uh, are they still drinking? Uh, do they have dependents? 
Have they committed crimes in the past? Uh, what blood type are they? Oh, I like this one. Have they given any money to the hospital? Uh, and so some people are going to say, you know, some of these you should have no effect whatsoever on whether you get a kidney. And others are saying, wait a minute, if this hospital funder gave $20 million and they're not going to give it unless you give them a kidney, then you're going to be able to save a lot of lives with the $20 million and now we've got to think about what to do. Uh, and so people will disagree about some of these, but they're going to agree about a lot of them. Uh, so what we do is we take people's reactions to those. We say, OK, compare 1 to 3 and 2 to 4 uh, and 4 to 7 and 7 to 5. And then we get what people who ought to get the kidney according to people. And then for each person, we're able to determine which features are affecting your particular judgment and how these features interact. It's not going to be as simple as this one gets a 5 and that one gets a 3. You're not weighing how many grams there are on each side of the scale. Uh, but the computer can handle all kinds of very complex uh, algorithms. Okay? So uh, notice that now it's interpretable. We're able to say, your algorithm you know, gives you this judgment. Why? Because of this factor in this case. It's not the uninterpretable chaos uh, of many machine learning programs. Uh, instead, it's, uh, we can figure out what's leading to the judgment. There's still a big problem, OK? And the big problem, of course, is that people are going to have undesirable biases uh, regarding race, SES, gender, religion, whatever. Uh, the solution, we think, is that you have to ask people which features it would be unfair to allow into their algorithm. Uh, and most people are going to say, well, race should not be in there, but it's going to still affect people that say it shouldn't be in there. Everybody knows there's going to be effects of that. Daryl's work has, has shown it among other people. Uh, and, so, uh, and so we can now get rid of the features that people think should not be in there. The problem is, as I said, sometimes some people will think so, others won't. There'll be some policy decisions there that need to be made before we can build this into government regulation. But what we're trying to do is gather information about how many uh, people think various uh, features should be. Right. It's also a tricky question on how to describe the features, but I won't go into that. The point is that we need to test and retest for these hidden discriminations in order to make sure that these are the, not just the judgments that people make, but they're the judgments that people think they ought to make. Okay? Uh, and now we've got uh, algorithms that people will endorse. Yes, that's the algorithm I'm following. Yes, those are the judgments I think I ought to make. And the computer is able to mimic those. Uh, what do we do with that? Well, we can compare across groups, men and women, uh, North Carolina you know, versus Pennsylvania uh, versus California versus uh, Uganda or Czechoslovakia or no, the Czech Republic. Uh, or so on. And so we can do all kinds of comparisons between groups. Uh, we can also go beyond the pilot. This is just all in the future, but we can ask people to just take any old moral problem instead of just the kidney case. Our plan is you do the kidneys, then you do cars, then you do weapons, and then you look at what's going to be in common to all of them. Uh, this is all in the future, so I'm not able to give you any details. But you can ask them which features are morally relevant, and that could vary from one area to another. You, again, extract algorithms for individuals. And you can compare between and within groups. So that you can say, why do my spouse and I keep arguing about this? And we, oh, because you've got this algorithm and she's got this algorithm, right? Uh, and so uh, we can explain why uh, these disagreements are occurring, OK? What are the benefits? Well, you can compare your judgments to the computer, the computer is not going to overlook uh, features. You're going to tend to overlook features, to get confused by the complexity of features and so on. Uh, you're going to be biased. The computer can avoid bias by not even entering the information that you think ought not to be entered. right? Uh, and so then you can take, um, so then you can take your judgments and compare it to what the computer says and realize that your judgments are not um, up, to, up to snuff, up to the standards that you wish they were up to. Um, and 
We can also understand why people disagree with us. We can know how many people, uh, which people disagree with us. So you can take the state of Pennsylvania and say, well, this group thinks this, and this group thinks this, and now we understand why. Now, you still have a difficult government decision about what to do about it, um, uh, but, um, but at least you have the information to work on. Um, and moral psychologists will then learn the computations behind uh, human moral judgments. Now, I realize I'm behind schedule, so should I go on and talk about cars in five or ten minutes, or should we stop here and and have the commentary. Three to four minutes on cars. Okay. Uh, I always like to talk about cars because what's the great advantage of computers? They're fast, right? I mean, we talked about them having all the information and you can avoid the bias. They're also fast. Well, for cars, you need in emergency situations to uh, make really quick decisions. And humans are not going to be all that great at it, and they're going to end up making mistakes. So uh, several companies have uh, built cars that drive themselves, uh, including Tesla, uh, which, can, which you can go uh, try out. Uh, and there are going to be lots of benefits there, reducing accidents. There are going to be costs like increasing um, uh, loss of jobs, um, but what I want to focus on is emergency situations, right, where you've got to decide whether to go this way or to go to the right, uh, go straight or go to the right. So imagine that you are driving down a curvy mountain road, and you go around a curve, and you see you know, this person in front of you. Well, what are you going to do? I remember I've done this before when I saw a raccoon. And I just said, I'm sorry, I'm going to run over the raccoon. I'm not going to go over the cliff. But if it's a human or two humans or three humans, then it becomes a different kind of situation. And you got to, oh, what about turning left into the cliff? No, you bounce off the cliff into them, and then you go off the uh, and so uh, And so it becomes a very difficult uh, situation. And the Moral Machine website at MIT, I highly recommend for this, uh, you can go, and this is the kind of model that we have in mind. I like to talk about because, you know, okay, so these people carrying the money, they're bank robbers, you know. So the question is, do you run over five bank robbers, or do you swerve to the, to the side and run over this, this nice old lady with a cane and, and this fat guy and this, this athlete? And, you know, and so they have all these little kind of stereotypes in there. Uh, and you have to decide, and then you can find out, like, what you thought compared to other people. Um, this sounds like, you know, a joke, but notice it, it reveals your values and it shows you how much weight you're putting on things. Let me mention also that there's a, it used to originally have, and I think still you can do it, people in the car are going to die versus the people on the street. Now what do you do? Well, Mercedes thinks they have the answer. Mercedes said on October 11th, 2016, we're going to favor the owner of the car. If it, if, it, if it decreases the risk to people in the car to slam the car into a bunch of pedestrians, too bad for the pedestrians, they're not our clients. Um, on the 20th of October, they said, oh, we didn't say that. <laughs> this is the way they always do. He goes, he was misquoted. It's like, no, he wasn't misquoted. It's on videotape, OK? Um, and so the question is, uh, what do you do? Well, one thing we do know from, from some studies is that businesses, you know, well, we certainly know businesses could program their cars to, in emergency situation, favor the passengers over pedestrians. And we also know that most customers would prefer to buy a car that favors its, uh, the, uh, the, the drivers over the pedestrians. They just want other people to own cars that favor pedestrians over drivers. Right? They want their cars to favor the drivers over the pedestrians. Uh, and so the question for us is, you know, what would you, which kind of car would you buy? You know, what should the laws allow? Should the manufacturers be held liable? There are lots of policy decisions here. I'm just going to announce, for lack of time, uh, what I would do. I'm going to buy a car that favors the pedestrian over the driver. Now, why is that? How many times are you driving down a mountain road and you see a person like in front of you? Like one in a billion. 
It's never going to happen. With these cars, they're going to be able to figure out alternative ways to avoid it. So the risk to you of having to drive over the cliff in order to save somebody's life is extraordinarily tiny. But if you buy the car that favors the pedestrian, every night you can sleep well thinking that you're a good person. And that's almost <laughs> certain, right? And so you get a lot of benefit out of it. So I think you ought to buy that car. But I know that people are not going to be uh, persuaded. In fact, they're going to buy the other cars. And if everybody bought those cars, then we would have more deaths and accidents. So I think legislators, this is a, an example of where Everybody's going to do it because it's in their own self-interest. But if everybody does it, it's horrible for society. It's going to be worse for society. So it's exactly the kind of case where we need legislation. So I think legislators should prohibit these self-driving cars that favor passengers over others. And you'll notice Mercedes previously said German law actually prohibits that. It's not clear how, whether Americans would favor such regulations or not. I'm not, at this point, just doing descriptive. I'm doing normative ethics and saying they should prohibit that, uh, because if they don't, then AI is going to end up causing more harm than good in our society. So we've talked about AI in general taking over, building AI into the system. Here what we're talking about is the moral questions that arise from what kinds of regulations should we have to restrict AI uh, so as to make it as good as possible. Um, and, uh, and so there are a lot of different uh, issues, uh, and I look forward to discussing them uh, with you. But before you have questions for me, I shouldn't have done this slide. Now we have commentary. Thank you. Okay, so just, just for context, so uh, I'm going to introduce Alan Wagner, who's going to provide a brief response, commentary to Walter's talk. Uh, then I'll follow with uh, my own response, and then we'll take a, the last half hour or so of the session for questions from the audience, but also from people who are watching online. Let me just introduce Alan, my colleague. Uh, he is an assistant professor in the Department of Aerospace Engineering and a research associate in the Rock Ethics Institute. Uh, he received his PhD from Georgia Institute of Technology's College of Computing. Uh, his research and teaching interests focus on the development of techniques that allow robots to interact with a wide variety of people in various social contexts. Uh, he's currently investigating human-robot trust in the conditions which encourage or discourage people from trusting uh, robots as well as the possibility of developing robots which will evaluate whether or not they can trust people. Uh, application areas for these interests range from military to healthcare, with particular emphasis on search and rescue and hum humanitarian applications. Uh, he's won several awards for his research. He was selected for the Air Force Young Investigator Program. His research on robot deception has gained a lot of uh, media coverage, resulting in articles in the Wall Street Journal, New Scientist Magazine, the Journal of Science, and it was described as the 13th most important invention of 2010 by Time Magazine. Unlucky 13. Unlucky 13. Oh, lucky. Um, so I've had the good fortune to, to chat with Alan, meet his robot, Baxter. It's fun. It was intimidating, but fun. <laughs> and so he'll tell, he'll tell us a little bit about his response to Walter. Thank you very much for the introduction. Okay. Um, what do I do, Whitney? It's on the desk. No. Oops. This is why we need artificial intelligence, you know. There we go. A computer would be able to figure out yeah. what to do very quickly. Okay. Um, thank you for the wonderful uh, introduction, Daryl. Um, one thing I wanted, since we talked a bit about artificial uh, um, autonomous driving, I would want to mention some of the aspects of artificial driving or autonomous driving, which kind of get left out of the media story. So it's often noted that they result in a net decrease in accidents. But what you don't hear about necessarily is that in the beginning, the Google car, for example, used to stop at every yellow light. And that resulted in a huge number of accidents not by the Google car, by the people that were running into it because they didn't expect for a car to stop at every yellow light. So it really comes down to the question of what does success look like for uh, an autonomous system. And you've got to be careful about some of the sound bites you hear about these, these things and these systems. As a person that studies robotics, uh, every day I, I'm confronted with some new um, 
you know, news or media report, which feels wildly inaccurate or at least very sort of odd. Um, but Walter brought up a lot of great applications of artificial intelligence, and many of which bring up very challenging moral questions. So I'll say that the intersection of AI and morality is not well understood. If we had a moral machine here today, we wouldn't necessarily know what that looks like. It's not necessarily clear that that thing would make the exact same sorts of decisions as us. These, these systems may or may not be moral, not only in their application, but in their form. So the robot uh, here, so this is Ishiguro from uh, APR in Japan, standing next to one of his robots. And Ishiguro develops very uh, lifelike robots that look exactly like him or exactly like his daughter or his wife. And this presents some very challenging moral issues because these things activate aspects of our psycho psychology which you know, uh, are in some sense false. There are a lot of other impacts of AI on society, including employment, warfare, sexuality, and we don't have the answers to these types of questions yet. We don't even know necessarily what the technologies are going to look like in any well-developed form. But can we begin to look at the creation of moral agents? So I would point out as well that the goals of AI themselves are not well defined. There are at least four separate goals of AI that researchers sort of agree that different ones work on. Um, one is developing systems that think like people. That's maybe what, what we sort of expect. But there are others that develop systems that think optimally or rationally with respect to some sort of definition of what rational is and within some environment. An autonomous driving vehicle might be something like that. Can it drive perfectly with respect to some de Google's definition of what perfect driving is? Um, systems that act, act like humans. Not that think like humans, but that act like humans. So they may think completely differently, but they act like we do. And finally, systems that act rationally in all different types of environments. These are four separate goals that, can not, that are not necessarily pointing in the same direction. They, they can lead to conflicts, confusion, and different types of systems. Morality is not well defined either. Are, when we talk about morality, are we talking about Judeo-Christian morals or Western morals or morals of today or tomorrow? For me personally, there's a bit of a concern that we'll develop robots that we're imbuing with our own sort of moral values, which may not match those in some area, other areas of the world or at some other time. Almost like a sort of moral, moral robot colonialism, where we tell other people how these systems should act because this is how we act. And that's a concern. Morals developed from weird uh, populations may not be suitable for non-weird populations. And weird is Western, industrialized, educated. Some are and some do. But rich democratic. Rich democratic, there we go. Something it's like not that. clear that these are the morals that an autonomous system, yeah. an AI system should learn, should use, should follow. Why not yet? A system must be programmed with something. The systems have to have something in them, right? So where do these moral rules come from? Well, we could pre-program them from some sort of guidelines, some sort of set of rules, laws of war, Geneva Convention, um, some driving rules. The problem is that you sort of get a one-size-fits-all morality. These are the rules that you must follow, and this is the only way that you can do it. And there's a lack of ability to adjust to new situations, which is sort of the hallmark of moral problems, dilemmas, right? So they're not, they, there is no clear answer, even for us. So pre-programming them, as, as Walter mentioned, is really challenging. What if we learn them from humans, right? Which humans? Who are the right humans? some group? Is it some, is there, is there some ideal human? Is, can we, is it you know, Jesus Christ? Is it the 
you know, the, some other sort of very moral figure that we can say, this is the person whose behavior you should model. <coughs> or is it the average human? So as Walter mm -hmm. was saying, we'll take a big norm over social behavior and see, just act this way. Or is it maybe the agent's family? Maybe this agent, this robot, grows up with some group of people and says, I'm going to act like them. We don't know the answers to these questions, but they are challenging, interesting, and difficult questions to ask. Here's another possibility, which is maybe more in line with what we see in the, the news and media. Perhaps morals for an autonomous agent sort of emerge when you get the right formulization of socialization, development, um, upbringing for an autonomous robot. So you imagine a robot growing up in the lab, it be, with the goal of someday becoming a wonderful robot citizen in the whole, in the wide world. Um, and the right ingredients are maybe things like empathy and compassion, and a sense of fairness, altruism, and emotions. And this all gets poured into a cauldron and maybe morality bubbles up. And what that might allow would be for de designing the system instead and seeing what happens. But the challenge with emergence is that it's not only what might bring us these artificial moral systems, but it's what we fear the most. Right? It's the most exciting, perplexing, disconcerting aspect of AI, that we could pour the ingredients of some system into a computer, a robot, or physical system, and that something might pop out of it that we haven't predicted, that we haven't verified, that we don't necessarily understand. Um, and as inspiration, you know, we have uh, short circuit robot, it gets struck by lightning and becomes Johnny Five and, and these other objects. And that's it. Does anyone else have any Yes. Okay. Okay, so I'll make my comments brief because I'm sure many of you have questions and I don't want to over. I don't want to take too much time away from those. Uh, so, you know, while I'm loading this, I can't decide what's more interesting. The fact that Alan owns a robot named Baxter, Walter owns a lemur at the Duke Lemur Center. And I think both are just fascinating. Um, Can I have Baxter meet my lemur? Yeah, yeah that would be a good experiment. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about bri very briefly is, as a, as a psychologist is who studies moral emotions and works with philosophers and engineers, I think it's interesting to think about, you know, as we've been hearing these two talks, what are the moral emotions that are possible for these kinds of autonomous agents? Could an, could an autonomous agent or an AI even have the capability for having something like empathy or compassion in the way that you might want? And how do we make sense of that question? So just to reiterate, Walter's program, as he talked about, was to uh, think about building human morality into machines through maybe top-down theory and position, that that might seem kind of uh, unlikely to be successful or more, perhaps more promisingly through bottom-up machine learning. But more interesting from my own perspective, could we use this to improve our own moral judgments by raising awareness of our own biases and trying to correct them? So if we learn that we have intergroup biases or that empathy is less responsive in some context than others, but a machine learning algorithm can spot that and pick it up, could we then use that to augment ourselves? And then he thinks that we can use this to build machines that are supported by human conceptions of moral agency. And so some questions we might have is that are moral emotions like empathy, compassion, moral outrage, are they appropriate to extend to autonomous agents, AI? Are they appropriate to receive from these agents? Is this a misapplication of terms from psychology to a context in which they're not really meant to apply? And then again, can we use AI to improve our own biases? But perhaps more critically, will people actually choose to receive the lessons from that kind of project? Will they choose to take an algorithm that can correct them and improve them and actually implement that in their own psychology. So, again, as someone who studies empathy, this notion of care bots or robots that help to uh, provide caring behavior for people who are in need, be it elderly or people with disabilities and so on, I think it's utterly fascinating and disturbing in turn. <laughs> um, and so there is this question many have asked, you know, should we accept empathy from AI? And you could ask, well, what, what kind of empathy are we looking for here? Do we want a robot that can actually 
feel and represent in some way the pain that we're going through? Do we want something that's motivated to help us? Or is, or do, is all we care about really the outcome? Do we have an, a care bot that can lift us if we fall or you know, if it sees us crying, step in and dance with us? Hopefully not erotically, but you know, dance with us in some way. <laughs> um, and that's an open question, what exactly it is we want. If we just mean functional behavior that's empathic and helpful and caring, is that enough? You know, do we want an, an AI that can implement a rule and follow it very predictably? Or would, we, would that miss something about empathy? Would it miss flexibility and the kind of intuitive sensitivity that some of our closest kin have to us when we're really in need? And although you might think that, well, sure, robots may not get there, by the same token, the kind of empathy we get from humans can often vary substantially. And sometimes, you know, someone can help us in a way that we think, what are you doing? That's not, those weren't my needs at all. <laughs> and so this may not be a unique problem to AI, sort of saying. What about empathy for AI? So you may have heard about Hitchbot, a wonderful little robot that hitchhiked across Europe and then almost most of the East Coast, I think, it got to Philly and then was basically disemboweled by some people. Uh, it was very sad. It, it, a lot of people talked about uh, the suffering in a very human way. Uh, more recently, there was some talk about how uh, Cassini, this, the Saturn orbiting spacecraft, was described as dying, as plunging in a suicide fall into Saturn as this mission ended. And some NASA scientists would say, well, this is not really appropriate using moral psychology terms that don't really have a true uh, referent here. So just stop doing that. Empirically, there is a, a bit of work that finds that empathy for robots is actually quite readily available. If you measure people's responses to the suffering of human hands versus robot hands and look at neural signatures that correspond to empathic responding, you see people are quite ready to say that bottom bot's hand is in pain. And this little dino bot, if you have a dino bot that's either being played with gently or tortured, uh, people find that you respond empathically in a very similar way, be it with self-reports or neural signatures, much as you would to humans. And so it seems like we'd be pretty ready to feel empathy for many of these kinds of agents. Poor little dino bot. And so is this inappropriate? <laughs> so if you Paper jams are very frustrating. Uh, is this empathic overextension something to worry about? You might think, well, sure, maybe it's inaccurate in some respects, maybe. But it, that kind of depends upon the capability of the robots in question. But a lot of work in psychology finds that we readily anthropomorphize things. And it often serves core human needs. Needs to master and explain the world. Needs to belong. So for example, if you get people to feel lonely, they'll attribute uh, this little clock robot, which what I've heard about it is really annoying because it, it drives away if you don't get up and get to <laughs> And so we're, we readily attribute mental states in a way that may not be accurate, strictly speaking, but is a common part of what it means for us to have human social cognition. What about empathy through AI? So can we enhance our moral psychology? There's some work that finds that, I think this is fascinating, if you get people to interact with a virtual AI, and kind of practice some of your moral emotional skills, your social emotions, like empathy, this might be a way to engender empathic emotions in a kind of virtual safe space with a live partner in a, in a context that doesn't really allow, have the same kind of inhibitors and risks and threats that might normally uh, be part of a human-to-human -human interaction. And so, as Walter pointed out, we could try to have algorithms that identify factors that diminish uh, moral emotions like empathy, like intergroup bias, and try to correct against them, place less weight on those factors. But I think a key thing, this assumes that we want to do that. This assumes that we're aware of the biases in the first place, and that we actually, if confronted with our own bias, would choose to program something that would counteract it. And I think that given the work that we've seen in other kinds of implicit bias tests in psychology, a lot of people are resistant to being told that they're biased in ways that are predictable and problematic. So I'll skip over this because I know you all have questions. But again, machines may reflect back the values that we put into them. There are plenty of recent examples of how our own kind of social biases, be it racist and gender stereotypes, can often be reflected back in machine learning algorithms. A couple, those are just two recent high profile cases. And so moral emotions for AI may be easy to generate and perhaps easy to receive, 
but there are continued questions about whether they're appropriate. There may be opportunities to use AI to augment empathy by diffusing the usual inhibitions about it, but this may assume that we're aware of the biases and motivated to counteract them. This is going to probably vary substantially across people. And then the broader project about building a moral AI come in with what uh, Alan was saying. We should think about how and whether AI encodes our own values and biases and how to try to navigate that as carefully as possible. And whether you want to use AI to augment yourself kind of depends upon what you're motivated to choose in the first place. And so that's all I have. But I want to open the floor to questions. And so we have about 20 minutes left. And so anybody who has any thoughts, suggestions, just raise your hand. And, or do you want to have them come down to the microphone? Shall we move up front? Yeah, let's all come up front. And so if you have any questions, burning questions or non-burning questions, just come down to the microphone here. And we'll take them order. No, go ahead. I'm going to put this against the wall. That's fine. Gerald, if there are no questions right now, I do have a couple on Twitter, if you would like one. Um, so Megan Kohler said, should grading be done by computers or professors? And that went back to a lot of what Walter was talking about as far as um, what's been happening with using AI in the classroom and in academics. So she made a lot of uh, comments on Twitter about um, using uh, professors and TAs, computers are using, are most closely aligned with assigning grades. So she made about four different, four or five tweets about AI in the classroom and in academics. So do, would you guys like to comment on that? So I, I'm, I'm a fan of its use in some contexts. In extremely large classes, they often, you know, drop it, at, you know, you can't have more than 400, you know, uh, why not? Well, there's just too many papers to grade. Well, that just seems a shame for all the students who want to take the course and get left out. If, if it's going to grade just as well in that context, then I don't see why the class hasn't built up. People get to take the courses they want, and they get the grades they deserve. It's very different when you're talking about an advanced seminar uh, on a topic where you want there to be uh, feedback and discussion, and you want that discussion to be a large part of the grade then I think it's much harder to see how AI would fit in. So should it be used? Yes, when appropriate. Good answer. <laughs> I agree as well. Um, you know, in, in large classrooms, I think you know, it allows um, education to the masses in some sense. On smaller classrooms, though, you, um, you, know, you risk, run the risk of a sort of version of mechanistic dehumanization, where you have a machine that's giving you feedback that you're then optimizing as a person. So you be, your writing may become more mechanistic in that sense. Great. And could anybody who has a question, if you could just come down to the microphone, that would be great. Because we are streaming this. Um, I wanted to ask about this distinction between interpreted and uninterpreted bottom-up uh, projects that Walter was talking about. So, and I, I guess I wanted to. Um, ask you about how you're thinking about this. So on the one hand, the interpreted project seems to suggest that the, that the way people make moral judgments um, or all, all things considered way they would make them is going to be computable or that there's going to be a, a, a computable algorithm that, out, that comes from this. And so there are certain reasons to be skeptical that this is true. One of them is that there are these um, moral positions like particularism <laughs> that uh, I think sometimes people think are psychologically true anyway, which suggests maybe there, that there aren't really very general principles or properties that people are applying and make moral judgments. Another reason you might think it wasn't true is just uh, you might wonder whether it is the case in any domain that we have an algorithm that mimics what humans do in any kind of domain of complex judgment. And you might think if it's not true in, um, say, for example, some domain like consumer choice, where the, the set of options might be much more restricted, why would it be true in a case like moral judgment, where the domain of moral judgment is just enormous? Then on the other hand, I just wanted to get your thought about the 
the uninterpreted bottom-up project. So I understand the idea that you could produce a computer model that was making a bunch of judgments, but you have no idea what it all means and why it's doing the way it does. And I think you're absolutely right um, that we would like more out of a computer model than that. Um, on the other hand, uh, there are techniques. Um, there are statistical techniques that you can use to try to uh, group together like cases and find out what the properties are that they share in common that are leading people to judgments even when you don't have a natural language term for those properties. And then there are also techniques that people use um, on uh, artificial neural networks. They sometimes call it a, an fMRI for the for the neural network where you try to analyze what the neural network is doing. And of course that's very, very complex and I couldn't pretend to understand it. But I wondered if you're being too skeptical about these, um, the, the possibility of deriving an interpretation after the fact from these bottom-up methods uh, that we uh, obviously we don't understand initially, but maybe there are other techniques we could use to understand what they're doing. Thank you. So there were a whole bunch of questions there. Uh, first of all, with regard to particularism, it's just false. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll argue that later, but that's why I don't worry about it. Uh, the, uh, with regard to after the fact interpretation, you can use things like factor analyses, and they sure enough group together these and those, but then when you get those groups, they don't make any sense. Uh, people can attach words to them, but then they're just attaching words to them, and they don't really, you know, they don't really make sense of it when you look at the particular ones, at least in my experience. So in, uninterpretable might be an exaggeration. You can't get a decent interpretation. You can come up with words and you can group them together, but you're not going to be able to project those categories into the future uh, for you to be able to make the prediction without the machine itself because you don't understand the categories. Uh, and your middle question was about uh, the uh, uh, interpretable and whether people really are following some kind of computation or not. And the answer there, I think, is no, they don't follow it precisely, you know, um, because we're humans. Um, but that doesn't mean we're not reacting to certain features and not other features. We react to the fact that somebody is in pain. We react to the fact that somebody died. We react to the fact that a promise was broken. And so those factors are playing a role, even if they don't perfectly capture you know, every judgment we make in every particular circumstance. And so what the computer would do is to take those factors and come up with the algorithm that at this point best represents the judgments of the person. But then ask a few more and see what the person says. And if it turns out they don't make that judgment, then it comes back to the person and says, OK, so now what do you think? Did you make a mistake or did I make a mistake? You know, and you might say, oh, you know, I just forgot about that. And so actually the computer better represented your values than your own judgment did. But it might not. And then the computer says, oh, well, then I better recalculate my algorithm. And so it's going to learn and get better and better. But it will never be perfect and capture a, I don't think we need to be perfect. I don't think, I've given that up long ago. Uh, what we need is something that's going to be a better predictor of what people are going to say. And the algorithm can capture that and get pretty darn close, at least in the, in the studies that we've done. I have a question for Walter. And this is an issue that was raised by the commentators as well. And so I think it's an interesting approach that you're using humans to help train the, the algorithms. And when you're doing such approach, especially in pilot data, my guess is you're forced to rely on some kind of convenient samples um, that um, sure. whatever's that, right? You're not randomly sampling the population. And of course, there are ethical consequences to that, to yes. whatever biases. And, and I'm curious your thoughts on both now, as you start to build this, as well as in the future, sort of what, what would your recommendations or thoughts be about how to feasibly go about training, even if you are using a descriptive approach, at least to, say, randomly sample the US, the world, and in a way that's feasible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is, uh, you raised that. Uh, the, um, you know, my answer to that is that I'm interested partly in the lessons of this for policy. So for example, let's take hospitals in North Carolina or Pennsylvania. And what policies should they have with regard to kidney exchanges? OK, so we're actually dealing with 
a couple of hospitals. And as far as I can tell, they might come up with different answers. You know, if my sample is North Carolina, I might get one answer, and my sample is Pennsylvania, another. One of our hospitals we're looking at is in Holland, yet another. Okay, I'm not sure there's anything wrong with that. You know, what you want is the policies of your particular society to reflect uh, the values that people in that society endorse. Not just endorse in the sense that they make those judgments, but when they reflect on it and they, they, they react to the features that those people think you ought to react to. Uh, and if there's some differences between North Carolina and Pennsylvania, fine. That's you know what democracy is all about, and it's nice we got 50 states and different places try different ones. Then we learn about what they do in Holland or what they do in Korea or what they do in wherever, uh, and we go, ah, oh, that's pretty cool. And then we read about that, and if people are convinced, then we change, okay? But the policies of the government ought to reflect, I think, the values of the people in that society, uh, except in this case where you know they're racist and sexist, and you. You know, there are going to be some limits, and you've got to keep within those limits. But within those limits, I don't think variation is a bad thing. The policy is local. I mean, I've got my own views about, you know, North Carolina's right and Pennsylvania's wrong. Uh, but I don't think policy ought to be based on my views. I guess one follow-up to that, though, I mean, to the degree that we have aspirations for moral norms and policies that transcend local context, I mean, surely a lot of moral, a lot about moral judgment is embedded within particular contexts. But I mean, does that not lead to the? Could that not just kind of reinforce particular kinds of intergroup boundaries and rivalries? I mean, I feel like don't people aspire to something that transcends the local? So in some cases they do. But take the kidney exchange case. So are we going to have a rivalry between Pennsylvania and North Carolina because you know, we give our kidneys to criminals and you don't? I mean, I don't, I think, I don't I think, see the rivalry. Uh, you know, we can then talk about it and we can discuss it. But, but I don't see that we necessarily have to have any rivalry. But in the end, there are going to be some issues that do produce rivalry and competition and, and disdain for the other side because they're doing it the wrong way, uh, and so on. And one would aspire to eventually come to a higher level of agreement and broader consensus. But that's a long way off. And so the question is, how do you get there? And my suggestion is we might get there by having groups of, uh, of people, societies, figure out what they really think about morality, correcting for the features that they themselves recognize they ought not to be considering. And then another society does it. Well, at this point, they're still different. Maybe 50 years in the future, after we've all talked a lot, we'll coalesce. Uh, but at this point, there's something to be said for letting them each go their own way to test, as they say, their experiment in living, to see which experiment in living uh, works out. Hi. Um, from a machine learning perspective, how do you handle trolls? Um, people who are kind of purposely outliers trying to make it do things that are, you know, the rest of the population would disagree with. Um, I guess this is partly a statistics problem and then just kind of ignoring outliers, but, you know. I yeah. mean, trolls are a serious problem. I never thought I would say that because my kids were scared of trolls when they were kids. <laughs> but, no, trolls are a serious problem. Uh, you have to have some way of, you know, some kind of catch uh, that'll, that will, you know, pick them out and dismiss them. Uh, but there's always going to be a danger that they will distort your findings. Uh, and so, luckily, uh, trolls go, tend to go in very different ways. You know, some trolls will pull you this way, some trolls will pull you that way. And so, um, in, the, you know, in the ideal, uh, they might not affect your overall results when you have a big enough sample and so on. But I think it's a real problem. If you have any ideas about how to deal with it, I'd love to hear. Uh, because that say, is you know, one thing we have not been able to figure out yet, is exactly how to deal with trolls. I was going to say, with the rise of the internet, kind of, you know, there's a lot of people out there who try to you know, pull things in all different directions. So in, in, a, you know, yeah. in an outlier way. Yeah. So I mean, notice, it, yeah. trolls are not new. I mean, when you, do yeah. a, when you do an experiment on campus, they're always, you know, the jerks, we'll call them. They're not trolls because they're real <laughs> people on campus. Yeah. The jerks who show up in your psych experiment and just kind of mess up your results by, 
mm-hmm. by you know, answering things arbitrarily. Uh, so you know, there are kind of statistical ways to do that as long as there are not too many of them and as long as they don't systematically bias your results in a certain way. If they do systematically bias your results in a certain way, then you have to study the trolls. And then you can correct for that bias after you study the trolls. So uh, that's all very vague and hand wavy. I wish I had more to say, but yeah, it's okay. a real problem. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for presenting to us today. Uh, the question I had you had talked about. Uh, deciding the morality between uh, passengers and pedestrians in driving different vehicles and said it would probably be the best solution if the government would legislate that you know you have to do one thing in every single case that evens the field you know protect pedestrians in all cases now do you think there'd be any situations in which there should be an exception that say we have a uh, school bus full of children for example the example is I was thinking of do you think there should be exceptions made that the common interest would agree on? Um, should should be different than, in, in that case, you would protect the passengers or the pedestrians? Oh, absolutely. I think you should give equal weight to the pedestrians and the passengers. And that means if you're driving a school bus down a mountain road, right, and you round the corner and you see one person, you know, in the middle of the road, and your only option is to drive it off the cliff or into the wall to the left, in which case you'll bounce off the cliff, then yeah, you protect the school bus and the kids. Uh, so it's not, I'm not going to say absolutely you never hurt a pedestrian, uh, but I do, do say the, the welfare of that pedestrian counts equally with the welfare of the passengers. Uh, some people might even want to count it more, by the way, uh, be, because they think, well, the those, that person might be more likely to be disadvantaged because uh, they don't own a car with this type of system in it. Uh, but uh, also, uh, the people in the, in the car uh, have seat belts and airbags and stuff, whereas the person on the street's getting hit by a car. And so you ought to take that into consideration. And in practice, that might actually give a little bit of preference to the pedestrian. But still, it's a school bus versus one pedestrian. I say save the school bus, don't you? Uh, I would agree. Yeah. Good. So it would we have to take some sort of utilitarian view then and trying to see which is going to do the less uh, least harm and quantify that in a split second decision, or are, are there programming things added, or how how do you draw that line? So utilitarianism is a general theory that applies to all of morality and all decisions. So I'm not in discussing this particular case committing myself to all of utilitarianism. I am, by the way, a utilitarian, and would be happy to do that on another occasion, but I'm not here, okay? Uh, here, there are some cases where utilitarianism or maximizing the welfare seems to be the right way to go. Notice in this case, we're not talking about fault. We're assuming that the pedestrian has the right to be there. There's no fault. You know, there's no fault with the kids on the school bus either. When you take out those other considerations that people use to limit utilitarianism, uh, then uh, it makes sense to maximize the welfare. Uh, but I'm not making any statement about whether those restrictions don't lead to anti-utilitarian judgments in other cases. Thank you. Sure. So it, I just want to mention that I, I love the trolley problem applied to autonomous cars, but it's so totally beyond what these systems can do. They can't determine who a prisoner is or a fat man or even if most pedestrians for most examples. If, if the... You know, if the um, Tesla vehicle had any model of the person inside, it would have known they weren't paying attention, and it would have stopped the crash. But they don't. You've got to actually physically touch the the, the driver's uh, steering wheel in order for it to know that you're there. You know, pretty sci-fi. Yeah. I totally agree. That's why I want the one that you know that favors the pedestrian because I don't think this stuff's really <laughs> ever going to happen anyway. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, they are working on autonomous weapons. I'm interested in what you think of those. There, they want to be able to, with visual evidence, with camera evidence, uh, or sensor, I don't yeah. know if it's camera, yeah. but some type of sensor, determine whether it's a uh, combatant or a non-combatant. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I applied for a grant for this and didn't get it, because in the grant application I said, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> and they go, well, we're not going to give you any money if you don't know how to do it. I said, nobody knows how to do it. So tell me. Do you yeah, think I mean, it's, it's, you know, 
to the extent that you can do things like that at all, I mean, a lot of times in, in a real battlefield situation, yeah. the only way it can autonomously target would be if there's a soldier pointing a laser. Right? Yeah. You know, it can't determine the types of people that are involved usually yeah. as far if as I know. If they're carrying a gun, that's a pretty system. good indication. Yeah. And, you know, but apart from obvious things like that, it's going to be really hard. Yeah. Daryl, we've got one, we, we're, we're about to wrap up, but I've got one question I wanted to see if you guys could get through really quick before we end here. This one came through on our stream. It, um, Addie asks, should, should AI systems be expected to empathize with humans? And if so, should the empathy focus on human conditions or human situations? So by conditions versus situations, if you're thinking about like human welfare and human suffering, like that's it, what they're, they're saying, as opposed to the broader structure with, with, within mm -hmm. which that suffering is situated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think that you know, a lot of people you know vary in terms of how they want to, what, what kind of empathic response they want from others. I mean, some people want you know they want you to comfort, they want you to provide care, but sometimes if it's a broader structural inequality that's producing the very source of your suffering. I mean, to the degree that there even could be an AI, an AI that addresses that kind of question, I mean, it sounds like we're a long way off. But I think there's so much variability in terms of what people actually want from people who are caring for them. I mean, that produces some of the very complexity and some of the difficulty of the problem. A lot of people don't necessarily agree about what they want from others. And you know, trying to then go from that to think about how we should program empathy into AI makes it an incredible challenge. And I would just add, sometimes uh, the person wants empathy, and you shouldn't give it to them. Uh, for example, if judges give too much empathy to the defendant in a criminal trial, they will often reach decisions that are unjust. Uh, and the same for you know jurors. Uh, and so there might be situations uh, when empathy is appropriate, uh, but that's not all of them. When I grade papers, you know, I'm sorry. I feel really bad that you're going to fail, but, you know, you did get a 23. Uh, and so I, you know, by the rules, this is what I need to do. And so sometimes justice might override empathy, and then empathy is not always the right way to go. Well, with that, we should wrap up. And I want to thank uh, Walter and Alan for joining us here today. And thank all of you for attending. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that was great. That was fun. We got some really interesting work to put together. Yeah, I'm sorry I went to. Uh... No, it was good. It was good. I think the self driving car stuff at the end is really useful too because a lot of people know about it. Yeah. yeah. I just I spent too much time going through the different samples and examples of the scanning. It's good. Yeah. Can I say it? I agree. I agree. The, the range of things that are going on. Um, so how long have you been doing this kind of stuff? We want to take a small long year to Sorry, do you have a question? I do. Okay. And I, there was a time. So I was wondering what you both think about, you know, a lot of the discussion was framed around the morality of AI as it stands today. So I work uh, at DARPA as a technical advisor on a program, well, on one that's autonomous, uh, like safe autonomy, and another that's about swarm robotics. So you mentioned emergence, which is, you know, something that you talk a lot about. And so what do you think, like, when you when you you throw an, an AI out, whether it's a UAV, whatever it is, you can you don't pre-program exactly what it's going to do. So there is all the questions that we discussed today. What should it do? But you don't necessarily know. And so now there's a lot of research into what are the bounds. Can we at least bound this in some way? But recently we've been talking about maybe these collective the collective behavior of autonomous swarms could maybe develop norms or like at least in, in, maybe in a bio-inspired way have their own culture or something like that so what do you think about like these uh, unpredictable AI that you throw out there and like no. So that's the real question, yeah. right? I mean, it's the real question both on the good and the bad side because we can't pre-program everything. We're going to need emergence in order to have intelligence, right. right? On the other hand, 
emergence could lead to God knows what. We don't know. It could be terrible in some theory. Um, so, so this sort of one question is, what do you do about these both sides? Sure. And like, what risk? I guess that's our decision. So risk what risk are we willing to? You know, that's maybe a moral decision. I, I mean, guess. one thing you could do is sort of bound the application, right? And sort of see what you get, right? And so if you put a box around the application, right. so let's say we're going to have a swarm, and the swarm is going to only be for humanitarian missions, and we're going to see what emerges within this boundary. We can also physically bond these things, right? You know, I mean, if they decide to crash into each other, then that's it, but it's limited in terms of risk. So we can limit the risk in terms of the, app, the actual application, its abilities, physical application, or the physical system, the application, and, and in that way sort of put a box around the risk. But there are some theories that say that the more bounding you do, the less it can learn, and so the less emergence you get. So it's, it's almost like there's no way to win. It's, um, sure, I mean, you can always have a centralized control like it looks like it's like bound for trigger, for trigger situations, but it's really decentralized system that's emerging on its own, learning and adversity or new environment. I wonder if there's a new morality, like I don't know enough about morality in a textbook person, but you know, is it a fluid thing that's constantly changing and emerging and will that change too as these autonomous systems so, so, So I think part of what you're saying as well is, can we set up a system of norms? Norms, yeah. which are sort of like local rules around an application, which is the way it acts, and it'll always at least follow those norms. Or maybe if we have a swarm, could they punish it by doing something to stop it? And, and this is basically group dynamics of an artificial intelligence system. It's per, this is pretty unexplored. One reason I think that it's very important. So yeah, crucial. I agree. Because if you guys know norms, you can something true. You have no idea why. Yeah. Sure. If, if, if it does something, you know why. Because I don't know. This person. Goes to jail for 30 years instead of 20 years. Why? Well, I don't know. And you go, okay, well, we didn't tell it. You know, say race. And you get the genetics, and it has a marker for super cell anemia. So now it's predicting, now it's, wait a minute, but that's because it's, you know, because only African Americans have super cell anemia. And so, bam, you got this. Well, if you don't know which factors are giving you some which ways, you can yeah. use for ways to live. That's why I think it's a much safer way to go to interpret them. Then we can ask the other systems. They still emerge. You're also surprised that you can figure out why they emerge. And then you can decide whether it emerges in a, in a way that's going to be fruitful and defensible or in a way that's going to be scary and problematic. And so part of the challenge, though, with interpretability is it limits the range, it limits the solutions you can use. So yeah. the, the latest advances are in deep learning, which is totally uh, uninterpretable. Uninterpret Although DARPA does have programs to sort of try to make it interpretable. Absolutely, and, and like the Go, the AlphaGo system, is not interpretable, really. That's absolutely right, like, and that's because it's Go. And so that's, in some cases, uninterpretable goes a lot down. But there are an amazing number of cases where it does not work. Like, for example, predicting recidivism, actually doesn't make sense. There's a wonderful computer scientist, and she's shown that you know, her interpretive system will at least as well as any uninterpretable system. And so why would you use an uninterpretable system? I agree that in some cases, an uninterpretable system is going to do a lot better, and then the problem is still there. So, but I would say for her problem, interpretability is always wonderful. But if you've got a problem, you just want to know if the behavior is bounded. Correct. Not necessarily if it knows why it did it, just that it stayed within some sort of box that we've drawn. Um, so it's kind of, you know, I mean, you can play the two yeah, so lines. We don't, we don't often talk about morality, we talk about safety. Yeah. Which is different. Yeah. Uh, so I like this framing. I just wonder, like, if moral morality would be something that emerges. As well. I think it would. I think I think it should. And uh, I mean, that's the stuff we're working on in our labs. If you have a social system, if you have something that can, through trade-off and reward functions, evaluate things like justice and fairness, 
do you get us in altruism? Do you get a sort of emerging something that looks like morality to us interpreting this thing's behavior? And so then you might get the emergence of sort of social norms, but also moral norms. Yeah, good questions. I make, my name is Sarah Redmire. I make a. Uh, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to, love to hear more about what you guys are doing. Yeah. So I was wondering 